Hello. Hello. I am honored to be here as part, part of this outstanding event. Thank you for the invitation. I am blessed to be part of a very, very special and amazing story. A story that I want to tell you tonight. Well, the first chapter here. You see, the, this story that I'm going to tell you doesn't have an ending yet. But I hope that the first chapter inspires you like it has inspired me. And in the near future, you're going to download the book like I'm going to download the book as well. You see, the story starts here in Ithaca with a community that decided it wanted to change the world and, and transform its public education system. But more specifically, a board of education that wanted to lead that transformation. A community that came together to come up with a common job description for its next learning leader. And the folks in the room who've been in this for a while, you know how difficult it is to come up with anything common, particularly a job description in our community. And our community did that. A very unique, I still have it, a very unique, complex job description, I may add. One of which took some time to go out and find someone to meet. So most public school districts in the country, they come up with the job description. Oftentimes they have trouble finding someone to match that job description. In this case, they found that person. Well, otherwise they had to go to another planet to find that person, but they found that person. It's a very, very warm area, by the way. But they found that person, that person was here. Someone who also was looking to change the world and looking to be matched up with community that wanted to transform public education for the world. And that's when we landed together, excited, inspired to change the world. But quite frankly, having no clue what we were going to do to do just that, or what it would look like. And we started talking. About 200 conversations, I think, in churches, public parks, barbershops, I was there when I had here, community centers, every building, hundreds of conversations engaging the folks in large, small, one-on-one -on -one conversations about what is it that we want to do when we change the world? What do we want to have happen in our school district? Now I have a word for it. It was called messy map. We did some messy map. And some things emerged, a theme emerged. Our community, our board of education, folks here in Ithaca wanted a school district, an organization that embraced thinking and everything that it did. Thinking kept coming up. Critical thinking. We know that the core of all creativity, problem solving, new solutions to problems that we don't know exist yet. That's what our community wanted from the public education system. So what do we do then? Me as the person tasked to help facilitate that conversation. So we want to change the world, embed thinking systematically throughout the organization, in all of my brilliance, and brilliance from other folks. We go out and find the best people in the world when it comes to systems thinking and embedding thinking skills in classrooms. You have to look very well. Because quite frankly, the Cabrera live right here in this ball. So we started with partnering with the Cabrera Research Lab to define what would be our vision statement and our mission statement for an organization that would look to change the world and embed thinking in a systematic way throughout the organization. And that's where we landed. Oh, my, there we go. I have to slide too. That's where we landed on a vision statement. The simplest yet most complex vision statement in the country for public school. It's not a paragraph that no one remembers. It's quite simply 6,000 plus things, which means 6,000 plus young people we have and our community. And if you know Ithaca, that will image is Ithaca City School District's value and those red dots are our schools. That bold goal, that bold vision, what we want to do. 6,000 plus thinkers. So what would be our simple rules? Engage, educate, and empower. Great organizations are able to put all that they do on one page, or one slide. Here's our one slide. So what we do. We even went so far, and this is where even the best school districts go. And, you know, a small percentage of them, they, they would come up with a vision statement and a mission statement. Some folks can't remember it, some can't. And then you oftentimes brand it. We branded our vision and mission statement also. We have it on t-shirts. You probably see it in the records. They're everywhere. <laughs> I can say now, all 1,200 plus employees of ours do know what the vision and mission statement is. They knew that two years ago when we rolled out the t-shirts. They asked me where. But what we said then, and I'm saying now, is then it was just a slogan. 
the, the real world starts. How do you, in a systems thinking work of way, make the mission statement mean something for folks? What will it look like when we're engaging, educating, and empowering young people to create 6,000 plus things? As a person, the new, new person to the superintendency, I didn't have images and pieces of what it would look like. I just knew we could do it if we worked together to do so. So then we started working. If you're going to start with engage, what does engage mean? The word probably most, most commonly used in education, period, is the word engage. I can say probably 99% of educators don't know what it truly means. Everyone's engaged in what we are young. And there are different levels of engagement. I've seen them all. I've done about 10,000 plus classroom observations in my career. And I've seen all the levels of engagement. Everything from rebellion. And I see that oftentimes. Now, particularly in some large urban centers, where young people are rebelling from the level of thinking that's better than the common world. I've seen rebellion. I've seen retreat to of folks are just sitting there, thinking about what they can do after school, but paying attention, looking like they're paying attention. I've seen ritualistic compliance, strategic compliance. I can tell you the strategic compliance looks like. It looks like rooms like this, where folks are not over here when I make eye contact, or they're in the class and get an A, or they check off the box and say they never there. Not there because they really would want to be here. And sitting in rows. Teach compliance has been what has happened in public school districts for many, many years. As an educator, as a teacher, I thought it was great when I had my class doing what was what I see now as strategic compliance. As an administrator observing classrooms, I would say, well, you kids are engaged. They're smiling, they're looking, they're sitting down, they raise their hands to speak, they collaborate when you ask them to, and they turn in all the homework. You're a master educator. Thank you for making me look good. I now know that was inappropriate to have happen most of the time. And there's a time and a place for all of these levels of engagement, even rebellion. But what we want to see most often in our classrooms is true engagement. And that was different. Quite frankly, when I was engaged as a student, I was referred to the office. <laughs> My little girl goes into some classrooms in this country, and the way I know she's engaged, she's going to get a referral to special education or to see the because many of our educators don't know what it looks like. We now, in our organization, know what it looks like. We show videos of what the other levels look like and what true engagement looks like. And it's changing from folks' mental model around what it means to engage as part of our simple rule, i.e., mission state. Then we talk about what does it mean to truly educate? Many things. And I asked you, I suppose this is the very research lab also, change with IT. We're here to create new knowledge in our young people. We create new knowledge by taking good information, i.e. the standards. We use the word with some set of standards, now it's a common tool, say, I can feel that's what the standards are. As long as you get young people to think about the information, that's when you create new knowledge. All this fuss about the common core, in my view, there'll be something different. How many different standards have we asked to guide young people to think about to create some new knowledge? We're having conversations like that about the information in the common core. They were putting up by you. How do you get them to think about it? Creating the knowledge. Rigor, another commonly used word in education. We define rigor quite simply. It's rigorous, and you can't go somewhere to find the answer. Think about that. How does that transform how you assess? In a state where young people are going into the state assessment are getting patted down so they don't have any price yet. So people are afraid they're going to cheat. Or they're filling out bubbles so you pick the question multiple choice test to determine how well they're prepared to be college and career ready. If you can't go somewhere to find the answer, how does that change what you do in classes and how you set it? That's the answer we're having. Physical and cultural environments, another thing. If you're truly engaging our people, what does the physical and cultural environment look like? Three years, two and a half, three years ago, when I wrote that one out, and I stood there in front of 1,100 people, and I didn't have an image or a picture to show what it would look like, that was unsettling, I must say, particularly in contract negotiations. But now, as our folks have gotten a deep, developed a deeper understanding of engaging and empowering and educating and have a common mental model about our vision, we now have examples. Go on Twitter, check out the hashtag ICSDPLC. You see our educators sharing, sharing images of their classroom spaces. 
that look very, very different from the ones you and I sat in for most of our educational careers. They look very, very different from what you're sitting in right now. As we seek to educate our young people using different tools, flexible seating options, writable surfaces. This space is this not a great picture on this uh, projector that you can see a fourth grade classroom or one of our elementary schools. What was beautiful about this one is I walked in as a superintendent and I didn't know who the teacher was. I later learned that the teacher was not there. We got four different groups of young people working on very, very different projects, all completely engaged and collaborating with not only the folks in the room, but folks down the hall and other folks in another school district. And the teacher was in another classroom for probably two years. There are other examples. Check out the seat now. Check out how busy it was. Ten years ago when I was an administrator observing in a classroom that looked anywhere like this, I would have marked the teacher down for having a messy room. That's, I thought the teacher applied was true and gave it. Yeah, we can write more wall. Because we're serious about creating and collaborating. Educate. What does it truly mean to empower? You see, when you look up the definition of true empowerment, it looks like the line between the teacher and the student being blurred. If you're truly empowered, you're always learning. So it can't be just the teacher empowering young people or young people simply empowering teachers. You have to be all learning together. That's a simple definition. You can see that on any website. But how does that play out? And what does it look like in an organization like ours? It looks like our young people meeting the parent teacher conferences. Well, right, we don't call them parent teacher conferences anymore. We call them student level conferences. Young people explaining what we do in assessment. What do we mean by the common core standards? What's happening in their classroom? What they know and are able to do. Schools, every teacher in the school, every young person leading that thing called the parent teacher conference. Monkey with 100% participation. That's what empowerment looks like. You see those simple rules as we've all developed a common mental model of transforming our organization. And here, you know, I just, I'm just going to show you one person who got the teaching code to his theories and the teacher in fourth grade. A young man who three months before this picture was taken didn't speak, kicked the superintendent and the principal in the knees because he was disrupting and so rebel he was rebelling in so many ways, but he had some educators who worked with him who wanted to empower power. He said, I'm gonna to continue to remove barriers until we both are learning together. We truly understand how to engage. And in, in a few months, he's now teaching code. As our lead learner when it comes to this week of our code. This is my favorite image slide of all time. See, I love it that I'm almost done. I'm going to now talk about numbers and accountability. Every other district in the country, the one I came from, they determined how well it was doing by based on standardized test scores. You can't change the world by looking at it once, one time a year, end of year state test. We have multiple measures for how we determine how well we achieve, including enrollment patterns, discipline, attendance. And for every indicator that we track, which are many, more than any other district in the country, and it's very transparent on our website, we've seen significant achievement increases. And I never talk about numbers. But it's fun to talk about them now. See, that's our one page. And I'm saying to you, it means something for folks in our organization. And the system's approach to thinking has transformed us. That's chapter one. Chapter two right now. And be much more difficult for us. But if we do this next one, bro, because we've met all the new goals, and the board's going to change the goal, new goal. We went from a goal of having 90% graduation rates, and now all of a sudden our contract is going to be 100% graduation. New goals always change as you meet them. These goals are what I'm now focusing on. When you think about system thinking and system, just systemic approaches to teaching and learning and transforming it, how are we going to be? See, we are going to meet those do goals, but we're also going to meet this be goal, be. We're going to be an organization 
that when one thinks of it, they think of love. We're going to lead from a place of love. What does love mean? Bigger than the emotional love. It means this, and you can do it. We're going to be forgiving of this, trusted, dedicated, humble. See, when, people, when young people think about how we're going to respond to any given situation, a missing homework assignment, a controversy in the community, whatever it is, they think about how we as an organization are going to respond, they're going to think about how we're going to respond from a place of love. Think about how that's going to change the organization. When we work with one another in small groups, large group settings, we're going to come with this mindset. With also an understanding of a vision and mission statement. Think about that in a state, in an organization that has been set up for us to have an us versus them culture. There are documents that many folks have developed mental models around that create us versus them. Hear me. That don't want us to lead with love. And here we're saying, for chapter two, let's go keep those documents and contracts in place. But our mental model is going to be around our vision and mission and this approach to leading with love. Stay tuned for chapter two. And I hope that I'm invited back to be a part of this video. Thank you.